We have Mark Budolfson, who is um, a philosopher at Rutgers University and uh, more precisely assistant professor at the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health and Justice at the Rutgers School for Public Health and the Center for Population Level Bioethics and is a rising star in, uh, in applied ethics. Um, and we have uh, Jocelyn uh, Porcher, uh, who is uh, uh, it, uh, a zoo technician and sociologist and research director at INRAE uh, in at Montpellier. And she is uh, really a specialist of the uh, co-working relation between uh, humans and animals, and not only as a scientist, but also as a scholar, but also as a practitioner. So um, uh, unlike many of us, so that's uh, quite interesting. Um, so uh, let me give the floor right away to Jan, uh, who I think is uh, ready. Over to you, Jan. Thank you. Yes, yes I can, you can hear you. Oh, that's great. OK, thank you. I'll, I'll kick off straight away then. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk today. I'm going to talk on the subject of bringing climate, biodiversity and other ecosystem services into economic decision making. Um, our experience of this, particularly working with um, uh, governments, is often summed up with uh, this sort of warning. Why isn't that working? Why doesn't it go to the next screen? Oh, OK. I don't know why that uh, was slow. So for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple and wrong. Uh, actually, we have many complex problems in the world. Sorry, what, Jan, we, we have a little technical. Oh, now it's OK. Sorry, we had a problem with showing the right screen. Can you try speaking again? Yes, yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it seems to be OK. Yeah. OK, so right. And you, you're looking at my slides? Yes. Excellent. Great. OK, so here's a complex problem. OK, we have uh, economic growth, and that gives us a lot of upsides, a lot of good things. So, for example, over the last 120 years, you can see by the dots, which are all the countries in the world, you see life expectancy increasing enormously and income increasing enormously. So we don't want to stop that. But there are downsides. We have uh, climate change, we have massive biodiversity loss, and we have long-term degradation of natural capital. Now, the simple solution that people suggest for this is we just start planting trees. It's actually a lot more complex than that. So actually, the complex solution is that we need to think about the drivers by which changes occur, we need to, we're planting trees on areas that are already uh, under land use, and that's going to change outputs. That's going to in turn change uh, imports, which might lead to uh, um, carbon dioxide leakage through the trade system. There's going to be legal issues about this, and we have to consider all of these before we can even know what the options are for land use. Once we've got those options, then we can begin to think about, well, what are the carbon uh, consequences of, that, of this change? But also, what about the uh, greenhouse gas consequences of other technologies for dealing with this? These are all quite complex relationships. We also th need to think about the co-benefits that will occur. Biodiversity is the one that, uh, that we're talking about at the moment, but you know, there's other uh, impacts on the water environment, on quality and quantity. What's obvious when you see the complexity of this is that you need a decision support system. This is not something that can be solved by just some simple single rule. Now, the response to this, um, both academically and increasingly from the political world, is to adopt a, a natural capital approach to this. And you can see this reflected both in policy change and also in the rules which uh, finance uh, ministries around the world are beginning to apply. So let's look at this natural capital approach to integrating science and economics into real world decision making. Well, it starts off with those natural capital stocks, uh, air, water, soil, geology, living things. These generate a whole series of natural processes, which then deliver us a range of services, commonly called ecosystem services. Those are not goods. Goods come about when we combine those services with the services of other types of capital, such as human and manufacturing. We get this whole range of goods here. But there's a big problem straight away. 
with this. They come in loads and loads of different forms, lots of different metrics, and it's really uh, impossible to try and trade off uh, milligrams per litre of water quality uh, with uh, carbon dioxide equivalent measured in tonnes, with frequency of uh, visits, with uh, wild species changes. So what economists try and do is to turn all of this into a single unit. And what would be the ideal unit? Well, it would be a unit of well-being. It's difficult to actually measure that well-being, so economists tend to use money as a surrogate for that. And we have developed a whole range of methods for actually producing these values, and most of them work pretty well, actually. But that doesn't mean that we've solved the whole problem. And one I want to flag up is wild species and biodiversity. I don't believe that we are anywhere near being able to put robust values on uh, wild species. So instead, what um, uh, we're trying to push is the idea that we should quantify these effects in physical uh, units and then apply um, really relatively simple decision um, uh, rules such as constraints, for example, requiring no loss or net gain. We take all these measures, we put them into the appraisal, we look at different options, and that's when we should be making decisions and then applying that and the system goes round. The system then delivers us um, uh, information on the sustainability of, um, of changes, especially looking at stocks, natural capital and other capitals, the efficiency of those changes, assessing all the benefits and all the costs and looking across alternative investments, and also telling us about the equity of distribution of those benefits and costs. Okay, I want to illustrate this with um, uh, an example from uh, the UK. The government has announced that it's going to plant at least three quarters of a million hectares of uh, new woodland. That's quite a bit uh, um, on such a small island uh, as, uh, as Britain. Um, we've got the drivers of change as before, policy, markets and environments, and that's what gives us uh, our land use. That in turn generates the values that we're interested in. A lot of those are in the market, but there's an even larger number uh, that, occur, that occur outside the market. And it's only when we consider all of those uh, effects that we actually get to social value. We're going to value nearly all of it, but we're not going to value biodiversity. We're going to use quantity measures for that. So to start this, we need to understand how land use changes. We need to understand the influence of environments, markets and policies upon that. And we're fortunate that we've got lots and lots of data. It's spread over a really long uh, time series and uh, it's got wonderful spatial uh, disaggregation as well. So we can come up with really nice uh, models uh, predicting the future and then we can actually compare that with what actually happened. And they work pretty well, actually. And because we've got models that work well, we can then say, well, what would happen if things changed? And there's many things that are going to change, but one that we uh, actually know pretty well is going to change is um, climate. And in the UK, that's going to result in uh, warmer weather and um, uh, changes in precipitation as well. Now, uh, if you've uh, ever visited Britain, you'll know that it's a cold, dreary, uh, wet place. And so actually, although climate change is going to be very bad, uh, for the world, and it will be bad for the UK economy as well. Um, actually, on the land, it's uh, actually going to make it a bit less cold, a little less um, uh, wet uh, uh, at various times. So it's actually going to result in uh, the ability to actually produce higher value uh, crops. So you see here that you've got the, the science side um, uh, providing the conditions, but it's the economics that determines the uh, de decisions that are actually made. So here's the situation at the moment. What we're expecting as climate changes is that we're going to get more and more uh, cereals pushing out uh, livestock because basically it's a, it's a higher value uh, product. So as, as the land warms, uh, we'll move uh, into higher value cereal production. That does not at all suggest that climate change is good for the, for, uh, the world. It's obviously not. 
Now, what we've been developing for nearly 20 years now is a series of models that link all of these different things together. So we've got the agricultural uh, and land use models that links to water quality models, uh, which is not looking good because all that extra cereal that's going to generate a lot of nutrient runoff. And that's going to have some pretty negative effects on the ecology of the country. And these models then provide the basis for looking at the values that are going to be generated. Some of them are going to be market values, some are going to be non-market values. And to illustrate that, let's look at recreation values. So we can value these uh, quite robustly, really. We've got uh, really excellent data on where people go and where they start their journeys. So um, we can actually see the trade-offs that they've got between distances and costs associated with that. But we also need to bring in information about the quality of those sites as well, which again is uh, available. So now we can uh, uh, estimate models which trade off between uh, quality uh, and value. We can see that as costs increase, so visits fall, and as quality increases, so visits rise. So we can now get uh, objective behavioral uh, measures of value associated with that. We can um, automate this for the whole country. So uh, these, these models operate at a very high resolution across the, the whole um, of the UK. And you can see there the recreational values that uh, come out of that. If you know anything about the UK, what you can see is that they're highest where people live. And they're quite low in some of those remote, beautiful, but inaccessible areas uh, across the country. And that means that if you want to change the provision of sites, you want to change land use, you ought to be doing it near to where people live. That will give you much, much higher value than if you do it uh, in uh, distant locations. Other things that we need to think about, those trees that we're planting, they're going to grow, but they're going to grow at different rates than in the past because climates are changing. So here we've got models of uh, how uh, at the top you've got uh, conifers, and at the bottom, you've got broad leaves. And you can see that uh, the conifers are going to have a, a bit of a tough time. So actually, as the uh, weather becomes uh, rather hotter and drier than they would like, they're actually going to grow uh, more poorly, whereas uh, continental species um, such as oak will actually uh, perform better uh, in the UK uh, as climates warm. Now, one of the big objectives of planting trees, of course, is to store greenhouse gases. And that's going to happen in various ways. Trees themselves are going to pull uh, carbon dioxide out of the air, but they're also going to change the soil carbon. And as we change land use, then that's going to affect the uh, livestock uh, emissions. But we have to be very careful that we don't uh, count those without, first of all, thinking about the imports of uh, carbon dioxide that are going to occur if we switch our production from the UK to other countries. So you need to allow for that carbon leakage. Although one of the things that's um, a pretty good um, uh, change within uh, the UK is that actually people are eating a lot less meat now uh, than in the past. So uh, there is some potential there for genuine uh, gains. We can see that uh, agriculture emits an awful lot more uh, greenhouse gas than if we move uh, into forestry, although it very much depends where you plant those trees. If you plant them on peatlands, you're actually going to emit more carbon uh, and methane than you store. It's also very important to think about what's going to happen to these products uh, in the future. If we grow trees that are of poor quality and we just put them into cardboard boxes and pallets, that carbon is going to be back in the atmosphere pretty fast. Whereas if we grow high quality trees, we can actually store that in buildings uh, and that will actually change the emission profile enormously. Coming back to biodiversity, so uh, we can model the relationship between land use change and biodiversity change. We can do this for multiple species, lots of different types. And we uh, find results that are actually quite disturbing for some uh, endemic species. Uh, so the red areas are areas where we're uh, expecting uh, very considerable uh, losses of species. 
One of the things that we've been looking at more recently is how do we compensate for the uh, biodiversity losses? And in the UK, there's been a, a recent law that says if you uh, build houses or infrastructure or that sort of stuff, you have to uh, compensate for the biodiversity loss incurred. Now, the problem is that uh, builders would like to do that uh, right next door to their building sites because that's uh, nice and easy. Uh, and while that is better than not compensating at all, it's nowhere near as good as actually moving those compensation projects to the areas that are best uh, for biodiversity. Of course, there's a totally different way that you could look at this. You could say, well, actually, we want to do this in ways that benefit people uh, the most. So actually gives them uh, access to the environment. That's obviously not as good for biodiversity, but there's some interesting aspects of that. If you do that, you could uh, basically use people's existing um, uh, um, uh, values for, uh, uh, for change uh, as the base of this, or alternatively, you could adjust for the fact that some people are richer than others, and we might want to actually uh, use these compensation schemes uh, to, to make poorer people uh, better off. And if we do, we will compensate in very, very different areas and actually raise uh, well-being uh, considerably greater. We're putting all this together in uh, uh, available tools uh, online. These are, are available now. Uh, you can Google them. You can use them for free. They're all open access. They will allow you to look at any area. It could be naturally specified or you could uh, draw on it yourself or you could use a grid. And it will tell you about consequences of change across multiple dimensions, such as what's going to happen to agriculture, what's going to happen in the water environment, greenhouse gases, uh, biodiversity and so on. I want to finish by um, uh, providing you with a case study that we've just done for the um, UK government about uh, where they should plant those new forests. And this illustrates a sort of political economy problem. If you just do the usual thing where you leave it up to the market, you get some uh, taxpayers money and you throw it on the table and anybody can apply for it, then really what you're doing is you're ensuring that the planting will occur in those places where agricultural values are the lowest because that's the lowest cost to, uh, to the person giving up uh, the, the land into that. Uh, and if you do that, these are the sort of locations that you can expect uh, planting to occur. Those are really bad locations. There, uh, there's a lot of heat in there, so you're going to emit uh, quite a lot of carbon. There's no real gain for biodiversity um, uh, and uh, recreation. And when you do the cost benefit, it's just not a good idea. You'd actually be better off not planting these uh, trees. Alternatively, you can target, and this is an institutional challenge uh, to governments to actually say, right, we're not going to put uh, money into some areas, we are going to put it into other areas. <clears throat> I mean. So you can target according to all the values that uh, land use change would generate, and you can add these uh, very nice uh, constraints to make sure that uh, at very least you don't uh, make things worse for biodiversity. Alternatively, you could rule, uh, put a rule in which actually delivers a net gain for biodiversity. And when you do this, you come out with very different places uh, to plant, um, uh, no planting on peat, uh, lots of recreation being generated here, lots of good uh, things happening to biodiversity, and the uh, benefit cost values uh, look much, much better. So instead of uh, thinking that for every complex problem there's an answer that is clear, simple and wrong, we think that you can get uh, answers that are clear, correct and impactful. Thanks very much for listening. Very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, sir.